I would like to introduce the 30th head football coach at the University of South Dakota, Bob Nielsen. South Dakota has their man. How's everybody doing? I'm Jay Elson, and this is Coyote Corner. Three weeks after Joe Glenn announced his retirement, athletic director David Herbster officially named his successor. 56-year-old Bob Nielsen, the reigning coach of the year in the Missouri Valley Football Conference, becomes USD's 30th head football coach. I'm very honored. Uh, you know, it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, uh, a place that uh, uh, certainly is very serious about uh, uh, the future of athletics and the future of football and excited to be a part of uh, what I truly believe is, is going to be uh, an exciting time to come. You know, I think we looked at all the different characteristics uh, in a football coach and what we wanted to have in a football coach here at USD. Uh, kind of a little bit of a long list and I was a little bit picky about it, but you know, as we ran through it, he checked off most of the boxes that we were looking for. And I think what we really found in, in Bob is not only someone who's a great coach, but probably even more so than that, a better person. Uh, knows how to win and knows how to win the right way. And I think he can really uh, pick up uh, the momentum uh, that from this past year left by Joe Glenn and keep us moving forward. It's tough not to like Nielsen's resume. He's won nearly 70% of his games in 23 seasons as a head coach. He took Wartburg and Wisconsin-Eau Claire to the Division III playoffs before landing at Minnesota Duluth, and that's where things really took off for him. In 10 seasons, Nielsen led the Bulldogs to a mark of 126. They went to the playoffs six times in that span and won two Division II national championships. From there, he moved on to Western Illinois, where he improved the win total in each of his three seasons. The Leathernecks finished 7-6 and six last year, earning their first playoff appearance since 2010. So with things clearly headed in the right direction in Macomb, why make the move? Nielsen says the opportunity to coach the Coyotes was too good to pass up. As I visited with people about the opportunity here, I um, was extremely impressed uh, with the university leadership. Uh, uh, the athletic department leadership, uh, their uh, their vision uh, for what they wanted uh, a Division One football program to be here at the University of South Dakota. Um, I, uh, I uh, in that process, uh, in that conversation, uh, found it to be the right fit uh, for me and and an opportunity to to take a place uh, that's uh, that's moving in the right direction and. Uh, continue that movement forward to, to make it something special. What we really talked about, Bob, is you can win a championship here. I want to get us to the point uh, where we're winning conference championships. I want to take a run back at a national title game like we did in the 80s. I mean, I think that's a realistic goal for us. And I think it's, it's imperative for us to set those types of goals um, each and every day. We ask our student athletes to reach goals every single day. We ask our staff to. They ask me to reach goals for them. So if we're not reaching very high, we're, you're not going to achieve much. And at this point, I think in putting the staff together that we have, we'll achieve those goals. Now, Nielsen met with the team for the first time Tuesday. Moving forward, putting together a coaching staff and, of course, recruiting will be two of his top priorities. National Signing Day coming up real quick, scheduled for February 3rd. Well, stay tuned. When we come back, it's back to basketball. The USD women got a rare opportunity to host a big-time program over the weekend. We've got the highlights next. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. Since moving to Division I, the South Dakota women have had the opportunity to play against a number of big-time programs, but they've had to go on the road to do it. Saturday, one of them returned the favor. The University of Washington, featuring the nation's leading scorer, Kelsey Plum, became the first Power 5 conference team to visit the Dakota Dome during the regular season since 1984. South Dakota fired up to take on the Huskies, and they played like it right from the outset, beginning with Taya Hemiller, the senior point guard. It's a pretty step-back three here, and moments later finishes off a fast break, created off a steal from Nicole Seacamp. Hemiller would notch eight points in a three-minute span to help the Yotes pull in front early. She'd get a little help from Jasmine Trimboli off the bench. The other Aussie on this USD team would knock down back-to-back -back buckets 
in what would ultimately be a 19 nothing run. Coyotes lead 21 12 after one but Washington fights back in the second behind great play from Talia Walton. She'd go for 13 in the first half alone to help trim the Coyote lead to five at the break. USD would maintain their advantage for much of the third quarter though as Nicole Seacamp starts to get some shots to fall but the Huskies would take the lead late in the third and never really look back. Kelsey Plum goes for 16 in the second half 25 for the game and that effort was second only to Walton's game high 29. Those two combined for 70 percent of the Huskies scoring on the night and that would be enough to take care of the Coyotes 77. 64. Now that loss snaps USD's 18 game home winning streak, which had been the seventh longest in the country. He Miller and Trimboli would finish with 13 apiece to lead USD, while Seacamp would end up with 10 points to go along with seven rebounds, four assists, and four steals. But shooting, especially from deep, was the difference in this one. USD went one for 16 from three in the second half and finished at 19% behind the arc. Well, despite the loss, Amy Williams was very grateful for the opportunity to host the Huskies. We'll get her thoughts on how it all went down after this. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. And welcome back to Kyle Corner. Jay Elson joined now by head coach of the USD women, Amy Williams. And Amy, it was a grueling week for you and your team between the travel, the opponents, the academic side of things. That was a real grind. It was uh, a definite grind, and we like to throw challenges at our players whenever we can. And, and um, you know, to have that trip out to California and deal with kind of time change, you know, mm -hmm. right, right, um, missed a couple days of school right before finals, which was, you know, an, an additional test for our team. And, and then uh, come back to, to play a really tough Pac-12 team, you know, on our home court. So it was a, it was a tough week. We knew it was going to be a tough challenge, and, and we learned a lot about our team and a lot of things moving forward. Well, as you kind of alluded to there, things got started uh, Tuesday night in San Jose against San Jose State. Now, yours is a team that, that likes to play with some pace. You like to get up and down the floor, but the Spartans certainly take things to a whole other level, don't they? Yes, they do, Jay. I mean, it's it's incredible until you're actually in the game to kind of feel that. And I thought we did a really nice job in the first half of just kind of um, winning that battle. And, and um, we got up and down and we took advantage and we scored a lot of points and took a good uh, uh, first half lead into the locker room, but um, I thought kind of maybe ran out of a little gas after yeah. trying to match that pace of play in the second half. And, um, you know, there was plenty of easy transition buckets that we gave up in the second half and kind of held on for a 10 point win. It's a great road win for our team against a very quality opponent with a tremendous player in the Ramos kid who's just, uh, I think, going to be a really special player in the Mountain West Conference this year. And so we got a peek at that. We didn't do a great job job of keeping her contained, but we found a way to get a win anyway. Well, totally different challenge than on Saturday. You return home, take out Washington from the Pac-12. What was the game plan for the Huskies? Because there was all kinds of weapons here that you were going to have to contend with. Yeah, I mean, we knew, you know, that we were going to have to, it was going to take a team defensive effort on Kelsey Plum and, and everybody on the floor kind of knowing where she was at. She's leading the nation in scoring. She's a very special player. She can score in a lot of different ways, so it wasn't going to just have to fall on, you know, whoever was guarding her at that time to, to try to stop or slow her a little. Um, and, and we also, you know, we're, we're hoping to kind of mix things up a little bit and to just keep them off uh, balance with, you know, mixing up our defenses and stuff. And, and I thought in the first half we did a really nice job of that. And, um, you know, but Washington's well-coached well team that made some adjustments in the second half and they came out and those uh, great players in the second half just um, were a little too much. Let's start at the beginning. You couldn't have asked for a much better start. You get off to that 19 nothing run in the first quarter, up 14. And then, uh, you know, and Taya Hemeler really was the spark for all that. Yeah, Taya, you know, came out to play. I just was really proud of her. I thought, you know, as a senior point guard, she took the challenge of, of guarding Kelsey Plum, but also, you know, just was, was coming right back at him and, and scoring on the offensive end, just sparking us, hitting some perimeter shots, just doing a lot to kind of keep our team uh, and get us, you know, that lead there in the first quarter. I just was, was really proud of how she came out ready to play. Uh, Washington, uh, as you probably expected, they would did overcome that slow start, but it was Talia Walton and not Kelsey Plum that really was the catalyst for them uh, offensively. Plum would, would get hers as the night wore on, but 
but Walton is the, is the player that really got their offense going. Well, right, and she's no slouch. I mean, yeah. she comes into the game averaging 18 points a game. I mean, she's a very good three-point shooter. We lost her a couple times there in our man defense, and, and she got loose a couple times in the zone as well and got some really good looks from behind the arc, and she just really made us pay. And um, once she kind of got in that rhythm, you know, uh, she was taking us down, turnaround jumpers, just, you know, kind of scoring in a lot of different ways and was, uh, was a tough uh, handle for us. But uh, we're going to have to learn from this and, and move forward. And the loss drops you to six and four on the season. Three more games, home to Dakota Wesleyan on Thursday, then at North Dakota and at Illinois to round out the 2015 portion of your schedule. What, what are you going to be looking for out of your team uh, over the next week and change? You know, we feel like, you know, nothing has changed. You know, we want to keep getting better every game out. And, and we just feel like November and December are the times to really learn and grow and continue to find, you know, find yourself, find your team's identity. And, and so that's kind of our goal is to, to find a way to get better on Thursday against Dakota Wesleyan. And then each game uh, before we head into this break, just find a way to get just a little bit better. And, you know, there's a lot of new challenges on the road at North Dakota, on the road at Illinois, two tough roads road games right before we break and um, you know so the next three games will really challenge us and throw some different unique things at us and and uh, we'll learn a lot about ourselves all right well good luck to you happy holidays we'll you, see you back here after well. the new year thanks Jay all right thanks Amy well just three days after winning at Minnesota the Coyote men look to clear the trap against UMKC we'll recap the matchup with the Ruse when we come back Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. South Dakota's win at Minnesota was a tremendous shot in the arm for the program, but it would have lost some luster had the Coyotes failed to follow it up Tuesday against former Summit League rival UMKC. The Coyotes, winners of four straight coming in, had a chance to match their longest winning streak of the Division I era, but the Ruse making life difficult early on. Lavelle Bell from downtown, it's the start of a big night for him. 1911 visitors. Next time down, Harrison Martez to Shayok Shayok for the slam. Kansas City up 10 with 10 and a half to play in the half. Yotes start to get it going from there. Shy McClellan, the bump and the bucket. McClellan scored seven. First half points. USD kept on running in transition. Trey Norris ahead to Dan Jack for the and one. Coyotes outscored the Roos 27 13 over the final 10 minutes and led by three at the half. Second half, more Yotes. Check out the footwork by Trey Burnett. That's pretty. Two of his 18. Coyotes built the lead to as much as 15. Back come the Roos. Bell got real hot, real quick. Stops and pops the three in transition. And a couple of trips later from way outside, he led all scores with 25. And Kansas City is back within five. Out of the timeout, Norris kills the comeback. Back to back threes for him. He scored 17 of his season high 19 in the second half to lead South Dakota to its fifth straight win. 79-70. In addition to the big nights from Norris and Burnett, the Yotes also got 12 and 9 from Eric Robertson and 10 from Dan Jack. First half there was kind of shaky. Me personally, I didn't have a good first half, but teammates picked us up, picked the people up who weren't playing good in the first half, and second half we somehow somehow found a way. We weren't really focused on like uh, going out there and like had anything to prove. We just wanted to go out there and play basically as hard as we could, and we knew if we did that, then we would take care of a few things. I think these last five games that we've won, our preparation's been on key with the scouting report before games, knowing what other other players can do well and what they cannot do well. So I think our coaching staff just puts us in a great, great position to win when we go out there. So as long as we execute the game plan, listen to our coaches, everything will fall in place. Fast forward to Saturday, Craig Smith and company shooting for a sixth straight win against CSU Bakersfield. USD looking to improve to 3-0 at home this season, and they get off to the right start. Thanks in large part to freshman Dan Jack, the big man would come off the bench to score seven straight for the Yotes. He had 12 in the first half, but his scoring would only balance the output from Bakersfield's Diedrich Basil. The Roadrunner guard would go for 13 in that first frame to help CSUB take a 39-36 halftime advantage. The Yotes would get hot to start the second, though. Trey Burnett with a triple here. 
And on the next trip down, Casey Kasperbauer notches one of his own. USD pulls back in front. Eric Robertson would keep them there for a stretch. The big man who went for a career high 17 helps push the lead to 54 49 with 10 minutes to go. But the Roadrunners would go on a 15 4 run from there. Ali Ahmed would get a couple of big buckets over that span. He'd finish with 16. Basil dropped a game high 20. And the Roadrunners escaped the dome with a 77 67 victory. The game was tight throughout, featured 10 ties and 16 lead changes. But the inside dominance of Bakersfield would prove to be too much. The Roadrunners out rebounded USD 36 to 20 and outscored the Yotes 34 to 20 in the paint. So the Yotes go one and one on the week. And when we come back, we'll sit down with head coach Craig Smith to assess their overall performance. Coyote Corner on Midco Sports Network is presented by Dakota Land Honda. And welcome back. Joining me now, head coach of the USD men, Craig Smith. And Craig, uh, I, I know coming off that win over Minnesota, you, you were pretty worked up about the idea of playing Tuesday against Missouri-Kansas City. Why were you so stressed out? Well, it was a huge win for our program, certainly, and the emotional high, especially for a lot of the Minnesota kids and all of our guys just fired up about uh, earning that victory. And then you have a short turnaround most of the time we have, unless it's a tournament setting where you're back to back to back, usually, you know, you don't have a day off then one game of prep and in UMKC who went on the road or beat Mississippi State mm -hmm. on Saturday, they have so many different things that they throw at you. Mm -hmm. So with a short amount of prep time coming off an emotional win, I was, we were pretty concerned as a coaching staff. Well, it looked early on like your stress was pretty well placed. <laughs> about, about halfway through that first half, you, you were down 10, but uh, something clicked from there. How, how did you get things turned around so quickly? Well, we got off to a slow start, certainly, and we had a couple guys get a couple quick fouls, and I uh, felt like they were much more on attack than we were, and um, called a timeout and got their attention, and then we... Um, Started picking up full court with our 2-2-1 press and dropped into our zone. I thought that got them standing a little bit and got them a little more tentative, tentative and it got us to be the aggressors. And from there on out, I thought we played a pretty good basketball game. Yeah, you, you went into the half with the lead, ended up leading by as many as 15 in the second half before Lavelle Bell almost single-handedly got them back in the game. Uh, fortunately for you, Trey Norris has a little clutch in him. He scored 17 of his 19 points in the second half, including a couple of big threes late to help put it away. You know, Jay, that's the first time we've really been in that situation this year. And with a new team and a lot of inexperience, you know, we get up 15 and we're really clicking. And then we come down and make a couple bad decisions when we have opportunities in transition to get easy buckets. And the Bell kid can really get it going. He's like the microwave, like Vinny Johnson <laughs> from back in the day. And Gets a three in transition, gets a net, and then gets back-to-back -back ones. And next thing you know, it's a six-point game. But Norris did really come through with a couple big baskets um, late in the game. Saturday, CSU Bakersfield comes to the Dome. And this one was a grind. And I know points of emphasis, freedom of movement, all that comes into play. Uh, but just didn't feel like there was a whole lot of rhythm as this one wore on. Yeah, Jay, it was a choppy game, no question. And, and with the rule changes, every game's gonna be a little bit different, and it has been. I mean, some guys really call it tight. Others, you know, it's like the old days, right. and it just kind of depends. And so players have to adapt, coaches have to adapt. Mm -hmm. And we were a little slow to do so. It was tough to get a rhythm, but you know what? It was tough for them as well. So that's, you know, far from an excuse, and we have to figure things out. One thing that did hurt you early, Trey Burnett picked up a couple of quick ones, ended up with three in the first half and just six minutes of action. How, how does it change things for you when, when he's unavailable? Well, Trey's a big part of our team, obviously, and he started every game since he's been here, and he, you know what you're going to get out of him on a night-to-night -night basis. And um, we, we struggled a bit offensively, and certainly he's a guy that can kind of get it going, and it was very productive when he was in there. So that certainly affects you, but that's why you have a team, and and other guys got to step it up when things like that happen. You win as a team and you lose as a team, and certainly there were some things in hindsight I wish we would have did differently as a coaching staff. Um, but at the end of the day, too, I'm not sure our mindset was right. And you got to have a competitive spirit to you all the time, and there's going to be ups and downs, but uh, it was just a really disappointing game from so many aspects on Saturday. We got a tough stretch coming up here. Uh, four games to close out the non-conference season. 
uh, with the first coming Thursday at Milwaukee. This is a team that just beat Wisconsin in Madison. Um, what are you going to be looking for out of your team uh, over the next couple of weeks? Well, we got the gauntlet coming up. You know, when you look at um, at Milwaukee, who's a top 100 RPI team, we just beat Wisconsin. They've won four in a row, and they're playing with a lot of swagger and momentum right now. And then you go to Illinois, Big Ten team, top. Uh, I think they're 140 in the RPI. Super long, super athletic. Another very good offensive team that shoots it well. They're winning three in a row. They've dealt with a ton of injuries this year, so they've just been kind of figuring it out, and now I think they've figured some things out. Both those teams are playing their best basketball. Then you look at UNLV, who's insanely long and athletic, uh, one of the top defensive teams in the country, and then Florida Gulf Coast and the Pentagon, uh, which will be a great game for us. It's a great venue. And then you got the Summit League schedule, which is top, <laughs> the top 10 team in the, league, in the country. Yeah, right. You know, so... It, it's on, you know, our easiest part of our schedule is behind us now and we need to really uh, get back into form and I like our guys. We've got a very competitive group and our sum has to be better than its whole, you know, and I'm not sure we got one guy that can just go beat you. It's got to be by committee on both ends of the floor and we got to get back to that winning formula. All right, well, good luck to you over the next couple of weeks, Craig. Happy holidays. We'll see you back here after the new year. Happy holidays, Jays. Merry Christmas, everybody. All right, that's it for Kyle Corner for 2015. We're taking the next couple of weeks off. We'll be back with you, though, Tuesday, January 5th, 2016, 8 o'clock, right here on Midco Sports Network.